my update. Um, so you have presentations this week, that's part of your grade. A rough draft of your final research proposal is due tomorrow, um, tomorrow evening, basically any time before Saturday morning um, is great to get it to me because I'll read them on Saturday morning. Um, so there's a drop uh, assignment folder here for your rough draft. Monday, remember your last field trip is due. Um, so it's supposed to be beautiful this weekend and a lot of the migrants are here. So definitely if you can manage to get outside and see something, um, do that for your last field trip. Um, and then next week, uh, May 8th, your final research proposal is due and you're done. So we're not gonna have um, classes where I have much information to give you. I'll just be available on Zoom during our class time um, next week to answer your questions about the project, troubleshoot things, anything you're having issues with. Um, or multiple people have asked like, oh, can I'll read different versions of this if you really want to take this time to kind of um, get better at writing, um, if that's where you're at. So th those are the only things you have due left, right? So you don't have that many things left for this class. Um, your Moodle grades, um, I didn't realize that something mid-semester had hidden the final grade for you guys. So I think I corrected that for this and Biostat. So you should be able to see the final grade that you're getting in this class, which should help you decide about the different grading strategies. So they pushed it to May 12th that you can decide if you want to withdraw or go to the FDS grading structure. So with this timeline, I should have all your grades in finalized pretty much before you even have to make that decision. So you'll know what grade you're gonna get before you have to decide if you wanna go to the different grading structure or not. Um, for the most part, everyone's on par for a very good grade in this class. Um, so please don't give up on this research proposal thing because if you can do a strong research proposal you could end up with you know a nice A in a class and that calculates into your GPA. So the research proposal just to clear up any um, issues that people have in this final assignment I just put some summary documents so um, this document uh, can you guys see this? It just has basically what I went over in that PowerPoint um, is in here. And then I updated the final project just a little bit to include what's due and stuff. So this you guys saw early on right after spring break. Um, and then I included a really rough rubric for um, the final project just so you can see kind of what you'll be graded on. Um, so see this, it, while you're doing is an introduction, methods, research objectives, literature cited. So then there's a lot of points basically on your writing style, your formatting of your citations, and the quality of your literature cited. So that's kind of what you're getting graded on. Um, any questions for me about that? Nada. Okay, the rough draft. I would love to see a super complete rough draft, but get me whatever you can and I can give you feedback on it. Um, that's kind of the goal. It's a little bit loose exactly. I would like to see all the sections fleshed out in some way. I've been talking to different people that the way I start writing these is often without inserting all of my literature into it right away. I kind of try to structure how I want a paragraph to be. We talked about how you're intro should go from broad to narrow so you can kind of get that scaffolded what type of information is going to go into each paragraph um, your topic sentence for each paragraph and then start filling in i think i would use this citation i would use this citation for all these different parts so that's how i usually write these things is kind of um, starting with an outline and then just keep adding in more information all right so no questions about what's due I'll send out an announcement too, just so that we know. Um, any other questions about anything ornithology related? Okay, cool. So Toby is gonna go first. I set it so that you can um, share your screen. Can you take over, Toby? Make sure you unmute yourself too. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, does everybody um, see the slides? 
Yep. Okay, cool. I'm going to start doing it. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Tubton. I also go by Toby. And today I'm going to be talking to you about this paper that I reviewed. It's called The Impact of Urbanization on Avian Species. So I'm going to get started. So, as an introduction, um, urbanization is basically the process where um, land is developed to become basically an urban cityscape. Um, it's also one of the main causes of extinctions among native species. Um, and there's three main reasons for this. One is that the, when, during urbanization, uh, habitats get modified. And by that, that can, that can include things like uh, bulldozing hills over, cutting down trees, uh, clearing out grasslands and replacing them with parking lots and roads and whatnot. So that can actually destroy a lot of native habitats, which can um, in turn just cause extinctions among native species. A second consequence of the urbanization is um, resource availability in that the process of urbanization causes um, a lot of resources like food and water and, and even shelter for a lot of native species to actually to just completely disappear in some cases. And lastly, biotic homogenization. So that term essentially, um, it's not an immediate effect of urbanization, but it's, um, it's the result of introduced species like invasives uh, that are well adapted to living in an urban environment, being able to move in after uh, the process of urbanization has taken place and they in turn would, will, would come into conflict with the, any surviving native species. So those are the three main causes of extinctions thanks to urbanization. So going back to this paper, uh, it's set in Sydney, Australia. So it's another um, international study. And their goals were threefold. Firstly, they wanted to um, check the different abundances of birds in three different habitats. And the abundance of birds was essentially just the number of individuals that they observed. A second goal that they had was species richness, which was the number of species, but not including the, uh, the exact number of individuals within a certain species. And the, last, the third and last aspect that they wanted to investigate was uh, the diversity of the birds. And they were able to calculate that by uh, including the number of individuals <clears throat> within a species, as well as uh, the, the number of uh, unique species. And I, I can sh I'll show you the, the equation that they used to calculate that later. So an overview of the research that they did. Now, um, this was set, like I said, in Sydney, Australia, and they had six, um, main sites, which were these inner city suburbs. And the study was done over the course of three months from February to April of 2011. And as I said before, there were three types of habitats that they wanted to investigate in this study. And the first one was a parkland, which was uh, so like a, essentially like a natural park, like something you would take your dog on a walk for, um, or similar to a almost like a like Central Park sort of environment. So that was the first one. The second one is a residential area, which is, it was essentially just suburban housing. So that was the second habitat. The third habitat that they were gonna observe was uh, industrial sites, which included um, not just like factories, but also uh, big high rise buildings as well. So those are the three habitats. Now, um, for each of these three habitat sites, the researchers randomly selected 10 subsites. And this result, they in turn had a total of 30 sites for all three habitats. So there were 10 parkland sites, 10 residential, and 10 industrial. So the methods. Now, for the abundance, they took the mean number of individuals that they were able to see along a line transect. And what a line transect is, is 
at each of those uh, subsites, of which there were 30, they made a 200 by 50 meter uh, line transect through that site. And the researchers would essentially just walk along this line uh, at, a, at, at a slow pace and would observe and count down, count any, any birds that they saw along, along this walk. The, uh, for species richness, what they did is a 10 point count. So what the researchers would do is that they would go to each of these sites and for 10 minutes, they would observe and listen for uh, any bird species, any uh, unique bird species, and then uh, calculated the mean number um, of species at that site for the richness. And lastly, for diversity, what they did is that they use this equation in the paper called Simpson's measure of diversity. It does look a little complicated, but essentially what it is, is it takes into account the, um, the, number, of, the number of individuals within a unique species, as well as the, uh, as well as the, total, um, the total number of individuals like, as a whole that were observed. So uh, yeah. So these were the results. Uh, oops, sorry. So what they found is that the parkland habitats actually had the highest number of recorded individuals. And as you can see, it's a total of 60. And on the graph to the, uh, to the right here, the parkland habitats had the greatest abundance of both um, native birds as well as just birds in general. Now moving on to the uh, richness of the species, the parklands once again had the highest number of introduced and native species. And the last result was diversity, and this time the residential areas actually had the they had the most diverse um, they had the most diversity in terms of not just native natives but also um, uh, overall birds in general. So uh, going on to the discussion, so the results that they, these people found was pretty much in line with uh, a lot of other studies that were done um, calculating the abundance and richness of birds. And a lot of other studies had shown that bird abundance and ri species richness is actually highest in the least urbanized areas. So places like parks, in suburbs, you would have a higher chance of finding more birds and more vari a greater variety of birds than if you went to, let's say, um, uh, a, a, like a downtown city center. Um, but going back to the uh, diversity, the fact that these residential areas had um, a lot higher diversity despite um, not having uh, as much abundance as the parklands is twofold. So firstly, um, it's theorized that there could be, in these residential areas, more uh, presence of more common species. And these three birds, uh, lorikeets, rock doves, noisy miners, are three uh, birds native to Sydney. The second uh, reason for that is that in these residential suburban areas, um, it's not just straight up uh, housing, but it's also, there's also lawns and gardens and, and streetscapes as well, which could actually attract a, a wider variety of, of birds. Um, so there's that. So these are some takeaways and conclusions that I drew from the paper. And the, result, the results of the study are that urbanization can have uh, some consequences on birds. And secondly, urban planning actually can have a, it can have a huge potential to affects birds both negatively and positively. Um, and thirdly, uh, if we constructed more green spaces like parks um, or just included more uh, gardens and in, in, in developed urban centers, it could, it could have a chance to nullify a lot of these uh, harmful impacts of urbanization on bird populations. And as we know, uh, currently birds are it currently experienced a lot, a lot of trouble um, in terms of migration and finding shelter and reproduction. So having a lot of these, having more of these green spaces could help uh, ease this, this, um, 
the, the, the negative impacts of, uh, of an increasing human population on them. So, okay, those are the sources that I cited. All right. Looks good, yay. <laughs> um awesome i think uh your that the way you explain their methods could be really useful for everybody because a bunch of people are proposing some sort of diversity survey for their proposals and so this could be a really good paper for people to use in their method section that says like i'm going to follow the methods of this paper and do transects and simpsons diversity index and stuff like that so everybody you know kind of working and listening to Toby's talk should be thinking like that's a way I can use that one to get my eighth paper or something by using it that way or in general the takeaway is basically like there's fewer birds and different birds in urban areas right like that's kind of the big takeaway um, and we've seen multiple papers like that so that's like a nice thing to put in your introduction when you're just talking about those broad effects of urbanization that's that's a really good one um, anybody else have any questions for Toby Okay, cool. Um, Patrick, you want to share your unmute and share your screen? Sure. Okay. You guys see that? Mm, no, you're not. Uh, wait, it's coming. Yep. Yeah, my internet has been really weird last week. Yeah, it seems like you're a little slow. All right, so I did mine on the interference competition between an invasive parakeet and native bird species at feeding sites. Um, let's see, okay. I wonder if it would help. So the, to, this is a, Patrick. I wonder if it would help for you to turn mm -hmm. off your video so we don't get a delay. Oh, it would save you some Wi-Fi. Yeah. About that. Uh, Okay, let's try it now. We can hear you good, though. This is my article. I said the title before. Um, okay, no. This is the species that they uh, are currently under study in many parts of Europe. Uh, this is the ring-necked parakeet, which is a popular pet in many parts of the world including Asia, North America, and Europe. Uh, but they're originally from Africa and India. Down here on the map, the red area shows where they're natively found. And then all these like, little green dots are where um, introduced populations have been found. So as you can see, they've been found up into like Western Europe and even parts of uh, the United States. Uh, this stuff uh, near Paris in France. Uh, where they looked at uh, several suburbs south of the city and uh, looked at eight existing gardens during, uh, I think it was from November to February. Uh, and these are the research objectives. They wanted to see the impact that invasive bird species like the ring neck parakeet on native bird populations by looking at interference competition, which we'll get to that in a second. Um, they also wanted to see how native species would react to the new invaders uh, and see how they would possibly deal with the, uh, with the competition of an introduced beast. And then they wanted to see what traits allowed these certain uh, invaders to become so successful. As you can see, he's hanging upside down on a branch. He's very innovative. So interfer interference competition is a process by which a species prevents access to a resource uh, so that it cannot be accessed by other species. And there are two different types. We have interference competition, which is basically a, uh, a, an animal active rise to uh, restrict access to a resource by, like, uh, by using agonistic behavior, such as like aggressive displays, animal away from the, uh, from like a, from uh, a food resource for like an example you know hyenas taking the uh, kill from a lion and then there's preemptive competition which is when an organism basically access to a resource just by waltzing in and just being present uh, this can be uh, 
it's kind of there's like a wide range of what it, of uh, examples. But one would be like uh, plants growing faster than their competitors, so that way they take up more sunlight. As we can see here with all these vines covering the section of forest, they, um, I heard one example where there was like a like bears in Yellowstone. They simply will just like walk up to a wolf to a wolf next kill, and then the wolves will just back off because they don't because they know they don't want to mess with it. So the, the bear doesn't actually even have to do anything in order to. And so these are their methods uh, that they used. Uh, they chose eight different gardens uh, based on consistent refilling of feeders and in, in, uh, yards and parks. And each of these gardens were, were at least 500 meters apart from each other. So that way uh, parrots couldn't just uh, fly between different populations. Uh, and then they were they would record videos of the birds uh, every morning, and uh, but uh, the cameras would only activate when they f when birds uh, went into feed, and they lasted about thirty seconds between uh, with a ten, a ten minute breaks between each of the sequences. Researchers also wanted to see if if a uh, like body weight played a part in interference conference. So they classified the different species that uh, that went to the feeders into different uh, weight classes. So, you know, we had like small, which is like zero grams to 50 grams, oh, whoops, whoops, my bad. From zero grams to 50 grams, a medium to 50 to 100, and large, which is over 100. Uh, the times were recorded on the camera, so that way they could, uh, and time of day, the, uh, the birds were coming out and so that they would uh, look at their temporal niche overlap which is basically um what time of day or like what specific times birds prefer to come out to feed and by, uh, they measured this by using the Chekhanowski index uh, simply meant that there was no overlap that the two species were uh, completely separate in their feeding times and then one meant there was a complete overlap uh, this figure kind of shows two different examples. It shows uh, dotted line means uh, how often the parakeets would feed at the at the feeders, and then the gray box shows um, robin over here. Uh, as you can see, the robins uh, tended to forage a lot earlier in the day, in the morning, than than the uh, parakeets, so they were the least uh, affected. By the parakeets, when compared to the starling, which had an almost complete overlap, and so uh, the starlings had faced the most common. Uh, and so these were like their main findings. Uh, starlings were considered the uh, the most affected by competition with the parrots or parakeets, I should say. Uh, and they found that parakeets also represented over half of the birds that showed up at the feeders, which is a serious problem. You know, because these aren't these aren't they aren't really that small either. These are like like pigeon-sized birds, so they're very large and they require a lot of food because they're also incredibly intelligent. So they, um, and then other species that typically visit the feeders were con considered similar urban exploiters like house sparrows, starlings, tits, and European robins, as well as uh, as collared doves and rock doves, which are pretty much just pigeons. Uh, and the native species basically showed a reduction in their feeding success and were often bullied away from the feeders uh, because the, uh, the parakeets were usually much larger than them and they were very aggressive. Uh, they went to their advantage, and uh, as you can see, all these starlings over here don't even want to go near these parakeets. They're just going to wait until they, uh, the parrots have their fill, and then they're going to fly in and try and get their food. Um, and this is uh, not as in, in France. They're all, it's, it's happening in a lot of places in Europe and uh, uh, places like Japan, and I think even in China, they have. Uh, problems and here uh, parakeets have been so habituated to humans that they actually will eat out of their hands so this is just like a quick video clip yeah can you give it a second hold on
slow internet. Oh, I think an ad's gonna play. Well, I had it open somewhere else. There we go. You can see how uh, it's everywhere. Wow. Yeah, they're all over London parks and uh, they, since they're so habituated to humans, they just don't care. <laughs> So uh, that's what I got. Nice, that's really interesting. Um, I don't often think about like parrots as invasive species, but <laughs> it's obvious that they are. Um, so this could definitely be used as like an example of uh, invasive species and in urbanization, or it can be an example of an invasive, invasive species and behavior changes. There's a lot that you could use this one for. Um, because like, remember when you're citing in your introduction, it doesn't have to be like the species that you want to study. You're obviously not going to study parakeets here, but you're going to use this to kind of say like, make a case for like, okay, like urbanization has this different effect. One of it is that we uh, move species to new places and then they might be better at exploiting them because they have these different characteristics. Um, so that was a really, I like that one. Anyone got any questions for Patrick? All right, cool. Uh, good job, Patrick. I like that one. Um, Jenny, you up? You want to share your screen? Yeah, one second. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Okay. I don't know why I want to start. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I did the comparative effects of urban development, anthropogenic noise on bird songs. And uh, the introduction talked about how impervious surfaces of developed areas affect animal signals by scattering sound waves and creating multiple reverberations that cancel and distort portions of the signal. And scattering reverberation and atmospheric and vegetative absorption are stronger for high frequency than for low frequency signals. Uh, an additional effect of increased human population density and continued urban development is an increasing level of anthropogenic noise. And this background noise like presents challenges for animals trying to communicate because it limits the distance over which sounds and signals can be heard. So for the materials and methods, um, the research was conducted at 28 different study sites across an urban to rural land use gradient in the greater Washington DC and Baltimore metropolitan areas. And actually there was uh, some participating citizens that volunteered their property to be used as study sites. And in some cases they were even allowed to help collect some of the data. Um, at each study site, there was a center point that was established in the front left corner of the property that was used for land cover measurements and ambient noise measurements. And then all the birds that were observed were recorded within 400 meters of this point. Uh, the six species that were studied were the Northern Cardinal, where 45 were observed, the Carolina Wren, where 33 were observed, the American Robin, where seven were observed, the Song Sparrow, where 36 were observed, the, cap the Gray Catbird, where eight were observed, and the House Wren, where 16 were observed. And these birds were chosen because they all vocalize at frequencies that are low enough to be masked by low frequency anthropogenic noise and high enough to be distorted by reverberant environments. And these birds are often seen in urban locations anyway, so they were like a good species to be studying. So the ambient noise level was measured with an XTEC 407730 sound level meter. And those measurements were C weighted and taking, taken for five minutes in total in the four cardinal directions. And then the highest readings that were recorded were then averaged. Uh, the readings were taken between 6.30 and nine in the morning because that was the active time of day for all six of the study species. 
And then these songs are recorded using a Sony TCM 5000 EV tape recorder, Maxwell UR Type 1 90 minute tapes, and a Sennheiser ME66 shotgun microphone. And then each bird was recorded once, and there was an average of six birds per site. And then the number of songs recorded from each bird ranged from two to 20. So the recordings were then digitized to generate a chart of frequency for each of the songs analyzed, which was then used to determine the minimum, maximum, and frequency ranges. Uh, to determine the effects of ambient noise level and urban development on bird song, linear mixed effect models, or LMMs, were used for each species. And for these LMMs, the minimum, maximum, and frequency range of recorded songs were set as the dependent variables and ambient noise level percent of impervious surface and the interaction of noise level by impervious surface were set as the independent variables. And then there was one model run for each of the three dependent variables for each of the six species, so there were 16. And there was a significant interaction between ambient noise level and percentage of impervious surface for several of the models. And then to determine which species were more affected by noise and urbanization based on their song frequency characteristics, they calculated the species typical minimum and maximum frequency for each species. And then the data was grouped into two categories for noise level, so high or low, and into three categories for urban development, rural, suburban, and urban. And then the results were that the ambient noise level across the study sites varied from between 60.7 to 74.3 decibels. And then the most common sources of background noise was air, road and rail traffic, as well as construction and things like pool pumps. Um, the species typical song range for the American Robin was uh, 1808 hertz to 3729, and then it was 1671 to 5260 for the Carolina Wren, 1377 to 7398 for the Gray Capperd, 1892 to 7195 for the House Wren, 1450 to 4666 for the Northern Cardinal, and 2114 to 7828 for the Song Sparrow. Uh, the minimum song frequency increased as ambient noise level increased for two out of the six species, with five out of the six species showing a strong increasing trend, and urban development had no effect on the minimum song frequency. Uh, the maximum frequency decreased with the percentage of impervious surfaces for two of the six species, the Northern Cardinal and the Gray Capperd. Uh, for the gray capper, there was a significant effect of the interaction between percentage of impervious surface and ambient noise level. And when the interaction between the percent of impervious surface and ambient noise level for the cardinal and capper was investigated further, uh, it was found that maximum frequency decreased with impervious surface at low noise sites, but there was no effect at the high noise sites. And then the robins had the opposite pattern from the cardinal and capper. And the frequency range decreased with the percentage of impervious surface for two of the six species, which were once again the cardinal and the capperd. And the capperd had significant effect between the percentage of impervious surface and ambient noise level, with the robins once again having the opposite pattern. And then for song sparrows, the percentage of impervious surface or ambient noise level didn't affect their minimum frequency. Uh, so the strength of effects of noise and urbanization on birdsong differed by each species. So for the species with um, a low typical minimum frequency, which was the capper, the cardinal, and the Carolina wren, the noise level had a strong effect on their minimum frequency, whereas uh, for the birds with a high typical minimum frequency, which was the robin, the house wren, and the song sparrow, the noise had little or no effect on it. And the effect of noise increased as the species typical minimum frequencies became lower. And then it was also found that for the species with the highest species typical maximum frequency, which was the capperd, urban development had the strongest effect on maximum frequency and frequency range, where there was little or no effect of urbanization for species with a lower maximum frequency like the Carolina wren and the robin. And then, so these figures show how as the ambient noise level increased, the minimum frequency for the study species also increased. And how, um, and then if you look closer, you can see how the American robin, the gray capper, and the house wren, 
they had larger increases as ambient no noise level increased, whereas the northern cardinal still had an increase, but it wasn't as great as the other three birds. And then in conclusion, the abundant impervious surfaces and anthropogenic noise both affect song characteristics. And then as ambient noise level increased, minimum frequency of birds increased, whereas urban development had no effect. And then when it was urban development that was increased, maximum frequency and bandwidth of songs decreased where noise had no effect. And that was it. Nice. I like that one. I mean, I, I say that for all of them. I realize that, but they all are cool. You guys picked really good articles. Um, I think that would be a really good one in people's introduction, even if you don't want to study song, when you're talking about the effects of urbanization. So you could say the effect of urbanization on bird diversity, on invasive species, and on um, song. Like that's basically what Jenny's would be, would be like citing like this. And it, it, it's nuanced, right? It was like some species and not others, but in general, you could use that paper to say, look, urbanization creates noise and that has an impact on like the, the bird's production of song, which is really important for them. So that was a great, great one to add into the mix of what everybody knows. Um, everybody remember that you should be uploading on Moodle your PowerPoint and the PDF that you um, had so that I can, I'm gonna at the end of class today, go through and upload everything so that when you're trying to finish your rough draft, you can look over people's PowerPoints and their PDFs and use them um, for your paper. Um, good job, Jenny. Okay, so our next, uh, I'll go to Rob next, who was in the process of losing his voice. So he recorded his in advance. Um, so we're gonna watch it as a YouTube clip. Grab on. Um, I've seen him coming and going. Oh yeah, he's on here now. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat to Rob. I'm recording this in advance of class because you guys can hear that, right? Okay. I feel like I'm getting sick right now. I'm not sure that I'd actually be able to talk tomorrow when I was supposed to give the presentation. So I figured, you know, record something while I still have a voice. Um, getting right into it, my presentation is about a paper that's titled Consequences of Urbanizing Landscapes to Reproductive Performance of Birds in Remnant Forests. The background for the paper is that it was an 11-year study done from 2001 to 2011. It involved the monitoring of 4,264 nests of five forest breeding songbird species that we'll mention later in the paper in 19 mature protected riparian forests in central Ohio. The forests were located on an urban to rural land use gradient with all locations having some heavy fragmentation as a result of human presence. This could just mean that there's houses in the forest or there's roads. It could also mean that there's full farms in the forest. The primary difference between the sites is that is based on the dominant land use type, whether or not they were agricultural or urban. And it's not based on the amount of forest actually within the landscape matrix. The focus was more on how agricultural and how urban it is and how well the birds survive. The authors actually derived a complete urbanization index for the purpose of defining the level of urbanization of the sample sites. The farther negative it is, the more rural, and the farther positive it is, the more urban, it is centered around that zero point. The goal of the study was to answer the question, how does an urbanizing landscape matrix affect avian reproductive performance? And then they focused particularly on nest survival and brood parasitism rates, as well as annual reproductive output of the two focal species of the area. A little bit of background in case you guys don't know. Brood parasitism is when a bird lays its eggs in the nest of another individual with the intent of having said other individual raise the eggs as their own. This is the human equivalent of having a baby, leaving that baby on someone else's doorstep, and hoping that the parents 
at that doorstep will take it as their own and incur the entire cost of raising that child. Annual reproductive output is the amount of offspring that an individual or pair can produce in one year. Understanding the ecological processes that operate within metropolitan areas is critical if we are to conserve biological diversity in a world that grows more urbanized every day. That's why this study is so important. It's for conservation purposes. Into the materials and methods. From March to September in those selected years, the authors searched the forests for the nests of five understory nesting songbirds. The first one being the Northern Cardinal, the second, the American Robin, Acadia flycatcher, gray catbird, wood thrush, with the amount of nests that they found listed on the far right and their scientific name here in the center. These nests were checked in two to four day intervals, either by viewing the nest contents with binoculars or by observing parental behavior to track the stage that the nest is at. The nests were observed from greater than 10 meters so as not to attract predators to the nests as this would skew the results of you know, survival rates. If predators can find the nests, they're gonna destroy them. And obviously those birds won't survive. If predators were detected in the vicinity at the time of sampling, the nest check would be delayed. They would come back when there's clearly no predators around. The researchers were testing for brood parasitism via brown-headed cowbirds by checking for their eggs in the nests of the sample species. And this is referred to in percentage of nests parasitized per species per year. Um, this is only done for the cardinal and flycatcher, as I believe they said that those were the only ones that they found significant results in. Additionally, the researchers track the daily survival rates of the nests by the species or on the species level. These were averaged out over the year that they were sampled in. So like all the samples in 2001 were put together and uh, listed on a scatter plot, which I'll show later. And uh, the rate for this is the percentage of nest survival per species per year with respect to the urbanization level of the nests. Rephrasing that, because that's a train wreck, um, it's the annual survival rate of a species with respect to urbanization level. That sounds better. Um, mentioned previously, all of the sample forests in this experiment were assigned an urbanization level based on the, you know, how urbanized it is or how agricultural it is. And all nests within a certain forest section were given the same rating. So if a bunch of nests are in a forest cluster that was rated negative 1.5 because it's heavily agriculturalized, that's how that's um, demonstrated. Because there is two main tracks that the authors went with this paper, I had to take um, two graphs from the paper to show you exactly what their results mean. And this one has to do with the daily nest survival rates of uh, those five species that we mentioned over the 11 year period here. Um, this was a column, like a, a column chart that they were trying to stack and show correlations with. On the x-axis of each of these, we have the urbanization index that I mentioned before. The farther negative you get, the more rural. The farther positive you get, the more urbanized. And then on the y-axis is the daily nest survival rate with one being 100% survival. And, and then as you decrease down. The way that they plotted this was they took the daily survival rate every two to four days of those nest sites, and then they averaged them out throughout the year and plotted it with these symbols here. As shown in the graphs, there was no consistent relationship with the urban index. Moving on to the brood parasitism section, they used this figure to represent that amongst those two species that we were talking about before, the Acadian flycatcher and the northern cardinal. The main brood parasite that they were testing for was the brown-headed cowbirds, which is this beautiful bird over here. 
a little bit more background on what the brown-headed cowbirds do to, you know, parasitize their nests in case you guys didn't know, is that effectively a mama bird right before she's going to go lay her egg, a mama catbird, catbird, a mama cowbird, uh, she'll snipe a nest that maybe another female of a different species is already laying eggs in. She'll sneak in while the parents are away and lay her egg there in the process, often damaging or removing some eggs from that nest and replacing them with her own. Why exactly do they do this? Um, they don't have to incur any cost of raising those, uh, raising those babies. They don't have to provide food for them or anything like that. Additionally, by doing this, they are directly decreasing the nesting success of the host species that they left their uh, egg in, like, their nest. Cowbird eggs, um, they actually incubate faster than a lot of songbird species in that area, and they grow really fast into pretty large birds, which increases their demand for food from the foster parents, which is a which will directly result in the decreased health of other babies in that nest. They're not getting enough food. They're not going to get bigger faster, so on and so forth. It usually results in decreased nesting success of the host species. In these diagrams here, um, they, they turn that into an eight-year sample. Um, we have that urbanized index again on the x-axis with the percentage of nest parasitized on the Y, you can see that there is an upward trend as you increase the urbanization levels. And this upward trend would indicate that in these rural areas, there is less brood parasitism going on than in these urban areas for the Acadian flycatcher species. That trend doesn't exactly exist in this northern cardinal it's more scattered, almost flat if you averaged all those together. So you can infer that the Acadian flycatcher is harmed more by brood parasitism in urban environments. On to the discussion. So neither daily nest survival nor brood parasitism rates in remnant forests were consistently related to the amount of urbanization in the surrounding landscape matrix for the focal species. What that means is that urbanization gradient on the bottom didn't mean as much as they thought it was going to. There was that one exception that I was talking about before, that being that the Acadian flycatcher in this chart here had increased um, brood parasitism rates in urbanized environments. And then there was another note that the annual reproductive output of cardinals was comparable across the rural and urban gradient, but Acadian flycatchers made fewer fledglings as urbanization increased. That was just an author's note. There was also the ultimate point from this is that urban associated changes in bird communities are not, they're not the consequence of nest predation. What that means is that this chart here, the main thing that would make a nest fail is predation on it from uh, larger predators um, or parasites. So they would come in, break down the nest, totally ruin it, and that has no correlation to the urbanization gradient. At the bottom, as you can see, most of these charts are basically flat. And uh, yeah, there's my work cited. Yes, um, hold on. Thank you, Sammy. Cool. Um, I think that's another good one for, I mean, I don't think for your proposals, you should be proposing that you're going to do nest searching or nest monitoring that way, but it's still a good one that shows this, you know, consequences of urbanization. Um, I thought of it during like that video uh, 
that a bunch of you guys are seeing cowbirds in your yard this spring. So it's worthwhile to watch um, as birds start having babies. If you see a cardinal or something that's not a cowbird feeding a baby that's a cowbird, that could be really fun to see while you're cooped up. And um, also they're kind of indication about watching nests. I think we're all kind of keyed in and you might be stuck in your area and you might actually be able to find some nests this year because um, especially like song sparrows and cardinals and stuff tend to have kind of obvious places that they keep going to. But I think it's a good point to not get too close too often, even though ornithologists do monitor nests, but they made all sorts of um, rules where, you know, they're not going to go look into a nest if there's a predator in the area because it attracts predators. So just keep that in mind. Um, anybody have any questions? Okay. Is Paula looks like she's on. I don't, I, I downloaded this. Um, let's see if I can show you guys Paula right now. How do I get it to play? Does it just start talking? Hi guys, so the paper I chose was the town bird and the country bird, problem solving and amino confidence vary with urbanization. You guys can hear that, right? The Barbados bullfinch is a species of interest for this study. It's a seed eater bird and it is only found on the island of Barbados. It's its only endemic bird species and it is very successful in urban areas, but also abundant in less disturbed areas of Barbados. So 53 Barbados bullfinches were captured at eight different sites throughout the island and they were selected in order to obtain a good and wide range of urbanization rates, which you can see under the anthropization column. And 27 birds were considered rural and 26 birds were considered urban. So this is just a map to better depict the study sites. There were eight all around the um, island of Barbados, but you can get a better view of the urbanization rates of each site. So on the right side, you have the more rural sites and on the left side we have the more urban sites from which the birds were collected from. The objectives for this study were to characterize traits that enable species to thrive in an urban environment. They tested for correlations between behavioral slash physiological traits in urbanization. They examined differences between urban and rural Barbados bullfinches and predicted for greater boldness, better problem solving, enhanced immunocompetence, and less new phobia in urban Barbados bullfinches. They started by conducting a boldness assessment where all birds were presented with open petri dishes full of food and then the experimenter would hide behind a curtain until the bird had fed. And they measured boldness as the latency to feed following a human disturbance. Then they conducted new phobia assessments where novel objects were placed alongside the petri dishes until the bird fed and or reached a maximum of a 20 minute latency, as you can see in pictures A and B. And they measure new phobia as a latency to feed in presence of two different objects. They conducted two different problem solving assessments. One was the lid drawer task and the other was the tunnel task. So for the lid drawer task, birds could either gain access by pulling on the, pulling on the drawer or opening the lid. And for the tunnel task, birds had to pull on the stick to get the tube out of the tunnel and then had to remove the lid off of the tube to gain access to the food. So you can see that in pictures D, E, and F. So the birds were giving a maximum of 15 trials and each were for five minutes for both assessments and they were both measured as latency, latency to succeed. These are just two quick videos showing how they solved the lid drawer task and the tunnel task.
For the acquisition learning assessment, the petri dishes were inserted into green and yellow um, wooden platforms and the unrewarded color would have its seeds glued to the bottom of the petri dish and the rewarded color wouldn't. So a color bias trial was conducted first where the bird was allowed to eat from one dish and the color of the wooden platform chosen by the bird was considered its preferred color. Therefore, the other wooden platform would become the rewarded one in order to control for initial color bias. Birds were given five minutes to choose a dish and if they chose the rewarded color, they would be able to feed for 15 seconds. The location of the rewarded platform was switched at each trial. And you can get a look at the wooden platforms in the picture C. The reversal learning assessment followed the same procedure as the acquisition learning assessment, but the previous rewarded color was now the unrewarded color. So birds had to figure out that the previous rewarded color was now the unrewarded color with the seeds glued to the bottom of the petri dish. For the immunocompetence assessment, they used a PHA injection and they injected it into the proximal portion of the wing. It induces swelling, so they measured immunocompetence by um, subtracting the wing thickness from before the injection from the thickness after the injection. So boldness and euphobia are under section A. Their x-axis are rural versus urban and their y-axis is latency to feed. As for boldness, urban birds had a lower latency to feed, meaning that they were faster to feed following a human disturbance. And as for newphobia, urban birds had a higher latency to feed, meaning that they took longer to feed when in presence of different objects. In section B, there's problem solving, and we had the lid drawer problem and the tunnel problem, and the way that they measured it was by using their latency to succeed. So in both these problems, the urban birds had a lower latency to succeed, meaning that they were faster problem solvers and that they solved both problems faster than rural birds. As for discrimination learning, which was acquisition learning and reversal learning, there was no significant difference in the number of trials to succeed. So therefore, rural and urban were basically head to head. No one was better than the other. And moving on to immunocompetence, um, urban birds reaction to the injection was higher than rural birds, meaning that they have a um, a greater immune response to the injection and therefore meaning that they have um, enhanced immunocompetence. So in summary, urban birds were bolder, more neophobic, better problem solvers, and had enhanced immunocompetence and there was no significant difference between results in urban and rural discrimination learning assessments. So real quick, I wanted to touch on something that had to do with the new phobia assessment results. Um, I should have done it on the previous slide, but since this is a recorded PowerPoint, um, if I go back, I will just erase my previous recording and create a new one. Therefore, I'm just going to talk about it here. So I wanted to point out that this study had predicted that urban Barbado bullfinches would be less new phobic than a rural and instead it deemed to be the completely opposite. Um, the urban bullfinches were actually more neophobic than rural birds, than the rural bullfinches. And so the study has said that this, um, their contradictory data on neophobia is supported by the conclusions of um, another study, which reviewed innovation in problem solving and they stated that new phobia does not generally co-vary with problem solving ability, which basically means that just because urban birds might be better problem solvers, it doesn't mean that they'd be less scared of novel objects. So that was kind of the explanation between um, their prediction not being true um, regarding new phobia in urban birds. So in summary, there are trade-offs acting on birds in urbanized areas, such as requiring enhanced immunocompetence due to greater exposure to novel pathogens. There are also characteristics deemed true for urban birds, such as being bolder and better problem solvers. 
So in other words, adapting to a changing environment can require changes in cognitive and behavioral traits. Great, that's a really good one. Um, I think, is it Kim that did a neophobia one too? Last time, I can't remember. Yes. Yeah, so those are good kind of paired because like, where was yours? It was, it wasn't in Barbados. It was in Europe somewhere. Mine was in uh, Poland. Poland, yeah. So like what an, it's a nice combination of like um, how different urban birds are kind of responding in this like behavioral way. So you could use both of those papers for that. Um, great job, everybody. I'm super happy with how these came out. Um, I feel like we've kind of, we're, I'm seeing what should have been a 3000 level level of effort from everybody. So I'm really happy about that. Um, anybody got more questions for me about what we're doing? So I'm not, you're not required to come to class next week. If you want to just work on your projects or email me questions or something like that, I'll be here. If no one shows up, I probably won't have my video on, but I'll try to be around in case you want to pop in during class time for a question. Um, but so we might not meet as a class, but um, I'm so sad. That this is how we're ending the semester. Um, next year, if you're back around, we'll do some birding on campus um, when we get back onto campus and kind of enjoy it that way. Um, okay, cool. Uh, have a good weekend. Have a good uh, end of semester. Um, stay on if you have more questions for me.